speaking now. Um, uh, Mr. Sagmeet Sachal and his brother Abhijit uh, Sachal are youth environmentalists uh, who are tackling uh, a problem that has not been talked about much this evening. We have talked about uh, yeah, uh, institutions uh, that uh, could cause or uh, create barriers against hunger and malnutrition. We have talked about uh, uh, pesticides and uh, the our food systems. We have talked about conflict, but we have not talked about climate change now. And um, yeah, these two brothers from Canada, they are uh, combating climate change through the organi organization they have founded. It's called Break the Divide. And um, yeah, I, I think, um, it's better for them to introduce themselves and uh, the topics they are talking about. So, uh, here it to the two brothers. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here. Can you hear me properly? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, awesome. Is it here as well? Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Great. All right, so my name is Sithmi and that's my brother Abe on your screen as well. And I'll just start off by uh, discussing what food security really is. So it's defined as having physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And so when I was seven years old, I moved from India to Canada with my family. And when I was in Canada, we never experienced a lack of food security in my community of Vancouver, British Columbia. It's a very developed urban area with a population of over 5 million people. And we've always had access to nutritious food. But malnutrition is often a concept that's associated with developing nations around the world. But within the borders of Canada itself, there's a serious problem that not a lot of people know about. And most people don't even link malnutrition to Canada, which is a G8 country that ranks amongst one of the most livable countries in the world. And nearly 70% of all households in Nunavut, which is one of Canada's three northern territories, do not have access to readily available, affordable, high-quality food. And so they suffer from a moderate to severe form of malnutrition. But before I like to uh, continue, I want to ask you, who here likes food? <laughs> cool, I think everyone here, awesome. And who here likes uh, watermelon? Does anyone like water? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Great. So I want you to um, let me know how much does watermelon cost in your country? Three euro, four euro. Almost. Are there any answers for that? Three, four euro. One euro. Three. One euro. One kilo, yeah. One, One euro. euro. You have yeah. microphone. Yeah. You have microphone. Okay. So <laughs> can you now guess? How much a watermelon okay. would cost in the Arctic? Oh. It should cost a lot. <laughs> a watermelon in the Arctic? <laughs> it should cost a lot. Should be a lot. <laughs> Pardon? A lot? Okay, so. <laughs> so it's seventy dollars Canadian, or that's equal to around forty-six euros. <laughs> so one watermelon <laughs> is equal to forty-six euros. Can everyone there afford that? 46 euros for one watermelon. That's just to tell you how much uh, it's so expensive uh, groceries and food up in the north. And this is because they're sent up by a cargo ship once a year, or they're flown into the community because of how far they are away from urban population areas. And so there's a program that's set up by the federal government of Canada, which is called Nutrition North Subsidy Program. And they partially mitigate the costs of people uh, buying groceries in the north, uh, but fresh, nutritious, and culturally appropriate foods remain largely inaccessible. And for the main population group up there, which is the Inuit population, food is an integral part of their culture, and it's connected to their land. So the high cost of food put together with the huge poverty rates in the Inuit communities makes it very difficult for the Inuit to acquire traditional foods, such as seal, caribou, reindeer. And so their cultures are very dependent on these foods, but the rapid shift in their culture from being a nomadic hunter lifestyle to a locally bound culture has caused a disconnect between knowledge from their community elders and their youth in the community around food. And so today's youth are consuming more processed food 
And this has allowed them to face a lot of excess weight and a lot of different diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. And traditional food in the Inuit community consists of caribou, moose, rabbit, fish. And all of these actually provide a lot more mi micronutrients absorption compared to market bought foods. But in the modern days today, only 10 to 36% of the indigenous diet consists of traditional foods. And in contrast to the past, one of the reasons that the indigenous population is more worried about eating marine animals today is because of contamination of traditional foods with man-made toxins. You know about pesticides, you know about what's happening with the pollution and how the pollutants are getting into our oceans. And so this can also have a bioaccumulation and cause toxins to enter our human health. And so according to elders, climate change has been recognized as a serious threat to traditional diets due to their close ties to the land. And everyone knows Canada as being one of the most recognized countries around the world for its universal health coverage and commitment to children's health and well-being. But food security is an unacceptable status quo and yet another indicator that the Canadian government is failing our Indigenous youth. Absolutely. So in comparison to the rest of Canada, the Arctic has highly been inhabited by Indigenous people. So they've lived there for tens of thousands of years. And having adapted to this barren and typically cold region, this population has developed a close relationship with the land. So Sukhmeet was alluding to this uh, connection with the land because the environment has been the main source of their food, transportation, spirituality, and daily activities. One of the main dependencies for Indigenous people in utilizing the natural environment is that their food is based off the natural land. So hunting is the traditional way for gathering food on the land, whether it be ice fishing, uh, setting up traps for snow hares, or chasing reindeer. Uh, there's also seal hunting. And the hunting of animals depends on seasonal migratory patterns. So with the onset of climate change, disruptions to environmental conditions on land uh, consequently reduce the amount of land-based activities that people, the Inuit people, the indigenous peoples of the circumpolar north can regularly partake in. And those are central to their way of life. Activities such as hunting, herding, fishing, foraging, and traveling may no longer be possible. And there have been reports that uh, these activities are actually decreasing. So this is potentially disrupting the connection to the land that has made these activities possible. And uh, very critically in the Arctic, because of melting sea ice occurring for the larger, larger, longer portions throughout the year, the Inuit cannot hunt in seasons when it used to be possible. So they are dependent, as Sufit said, on expensive food that does not meet dietary needs. So essentially, uh, the question becomes, how does this level of food insecurity for thousands of Canadians go without any notice and without any change? So to understand the current political climate around Indigenous issues in Canada and uh, issues facing rural and northern communities, you must look into the history of oppression of Indigenous peoples in Canada. So when colonizers ran from Europe, indigenous peoples, land was stolen from them. In addition, Europeans took children away from parents to destroy indigenous cultures. So these were schools known as the Indian residential schools. These schools were plagued with cases of abuse, the spread of disease, and it was ultimately death. So much of the indigenous population of millions in Canada was reduced to only thousands. And in Canada's Arctic, colonization resulted in traditional knowledge being erased, uh, relocations into permanent communities, sometimes thousands of kilometers away from familiar animal migra 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 migratory patterns, um, where hunters were not able to adapt to this new sedentary lifestyle. And uh, this, along with a lack of wage-based labor and often encouraged idleness, this led to more alcohol and other abuses. So currently, the political system in Canada still have remnants of discriminatory policies that marginalized indigenous communities in the past. So along with the lack of awareness among the average Canadian and you know average citizen on these issues, this has resulted in the lack of political incentive to address the needs of hundreds of indigenous communities, whether it's water insecurity or food insecurity. So we wanted to do something as you to empower other youth to work towards the sustainable development goals, specifically for climate action, good health and well-being, and zero hunger. And so I actually had a chance to live up in the Arctic for six months. And I'm sure that Remy uh, 
can show you a picture of me in the Arctic, shirtless in front of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and it was such an amazing experience to be there. But again, I experienced these things that we've been telling you about, about how the cost of food was so expensive for me uh, living up there, uh, huge poverty rate, a lot of infrastructure problems, and all these things that are contributing to a diminishing health and good health and well-being. And so to address food insecurity in schools, I assisted with a breakfast program every morning where we provided nutritious meals that were full of you know, protein, uh, macronutrients, micronutrients that can get high school students and elementary school students throughout their day. Because sometimes these students wouldn't even bring any food to school because their parents could not simply afford to bring food. And so through all these experiences, my brother and I started an organization called Break the Divide. So in 2016, I actually had the opportunity to travel up to the Canadian Arctic. So while Sukhumis lived there for six months, I was up in the Arctic and I saw the impacts of climate change firsthand. And I realized that the implications that climate change has been having on Inuit health has been uh, very severe. So one example is that because uh, permafrost, which is the ever present layer of ice that's present in the tundra, because that has been melting at uneven rates, pipes beneath the surface in uh, northern towns are actually breaking. So if we're looking at a small community of maybe a thousand people in a very remote, co uh, a remote location, it's very difficult and there's not much political incentive for the government to act on an issue as such. Because these communities are so isolated and because no one really knows about these issues, uh, it's very difficult and the issues are not being addressed. So I witnessed the impact of climate change on these Inuit communities and Sukhmeep and I, uh, after returning from our experiences and when Sukhmeep was actually up in the Arctic, we created Break the Divide with the main goal of breaking down racial, geographical and socioeconomic barriers uh, between communities through personal connection. So essentially what we do is we promote dialogue between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities uh, in Canada and around the world to address the UN Sustainable Development Goals of Zero Hunger, Climate Action and Good Health and Well-Being. So through youth collaboration and involvement of stakeholder groups, uh, we've allowed youth across Canada and the world to really learn about the issues facing Arctic communities and advocating for change. So it's been very clear that while the state of health in these Arctic communities is not the best, there is definitely room for improvement and I'm currently 17 years old, I'm a grade 12 student in high school, so it can be being 24, we both bring vibrant youth voices to this movement to advocate for political change on a national level and to create more political incentive on an international level as well. So we find that the greatest way to combat these issues through our own experiences working with Indigenous youth in these Arctic communities has been to engage them in personal dialogue, to engage them in culturally relevant practices, and in doing so, by targeting the most vulnerable populations around the world, we will be able to work towards the UN SDGs, uh, good health and well-being, climate action, and above all, zero hunger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.